Thank you for downloading or streaming this message from Emmanuel Church. We are one church with multiple locations, and we believe God wants to bless you right where you are. In a few moments, you're going to hear some practical teaching from God's Word that I believe will be inspiring and relevant to your life. First, though, if you haven't yet experienced Emmanuel Live, we encourage you to go to our website, eclife.org, to check out our service times and locations so that you can experience Emmanuel in person or through our online campus. If this message blesses you and you'd like to support the ministry financially, again, you can go to eclife.org and click on the Giving tab and choose Online Campus at your campus. Thanks again for joining us today. We hope this message will be an encouragement to you on your spiritual journey. Well, good morning, Emmanuel Church. How are you feeling today? I know I probably say this every week, but it truly is a blessing to be with you here today to provide some encouragement to you, uh, some instruction from the scriptures. I often think to myself, do I really get to do this with my life? What an incredible blessing just to, to be able to share with you, and I don't take that lightly. And so if this is your first time at any one of our locations, whether you're joining us at Banta or Franklin or Garfield Park, or if you're joining us at our Seymour campus, if you're joining us here at Greenwood or online or one of our microsites, and it's your very first time, we want to give you a very, very warm welcome. Can we give it up for all of our first time guests? Thank you for taking the time to tune in or actually attend one of our physical locations. It's a big deal to us. And if it's not your first time, welcome back to you. Great to see you as well. Um, We're actually wrapping up a series today called Good Bones, and it's a relationship series. We typically do that around the time of February because it's Valentine's Day. And sometimes I bring my wife up here with me. Maybe we'll get her up here next year. What do you think? Is that a good idea? Would you like to see Jackie? She always steals the show. You're my fave, um, but uh, there's only one. I mean, anyway, uh, straight. But uh, anyway, we, so we've been talking about this idea that when someone, you know, wants to invest in a home or buy a home, they first check to see if the home has, you know, good bones. We actually stole the title of that, you know, from, from, the, from the TV show here in Indiana, Good Bones, if maybe if some, of, some of you have seen that. And the idea is that before someone buys a house, invests in a house, they check to see if it's got a good roof or good plumbing or good floors or good, you know, walls or whatever, good foundation. And we said, you know what, the same thing is kind of true in a relationship, that uh, before you go too far into a relationship, you should check to see if there's some good bones. And what are the good bones of a relationship? We talked about commitment week number one. Pastor Aaron Beasley talked about trust. Those are the walls of a relationship. Last week, I talked about communication. I had a toilet on the stage. We talked about going number two. No, we didn't do that. We didn't do that. Uh, I mentioned it. But anyway, we talked about plumbing. The idea was that you got to have good plumbing in a house. That's a, that's a good bones. And, and, and what does that look like in the context of a relationship? It looks like communication. And, and so we said, man, a, a relationship worth investing in has to have good bones. You can add other stuff like paint and carpet and blah, 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 but you need some good bones in that house. And so the same thing is true in relationships. So I want to talk about one more kind of good bones component to a house and also to relationship, uh, in relationships. And that is the idea of, of having a roof. A, ro- a house have, has to have a good roof. In fact, when an investor looks at a house and it doesn't have a good roof, it doesn't have solid decking and, and this, uh, this black paper, whatever it's called, there's a name for it. Somebody told me I forgot it, <laughs> uh, but you have to have this paper. Then of course there's the shingle. When, when, a, when an investor's looking at a house and, and there's problems with the decking and there's problems with the shingles, that's expensive stuff and it's time consuming. And so a lot of times investors will pass on a house that doesn't have a really good roof because there's stuff getting inside that house that shouldn't be in the house, you know, like critters. <laughs> Anybody have any squirrels or bats in, in their house before because there's holes in the siding or the roof or whatever? That is a big, big problem. Roofs are essential because they keep bad things out like rain and snow and wind and hail and animals <laughs> and they actually keep really good things in, like the warmth of the house. Your house is producing heat, it's expensive, and that heat needs to stay in. And so today I want to talk to you about what I think the roof of a good bones relationship is. Keeps the bad things out and the good things in. If you're a note taker today, check it out. A relationship with good bones requires, say it with me, forgiveness. Forgiveness. Here's what's true about life. Ready? It's going to happen. Maybe it hasn't happened to you yet because you're young, but it's going to happen as you get older. The people closest to you will end up being the people that hurt you the most. 
It's just the way it goes. Not all of them. Hopefully not all your best friends. Hopefully not your spouse. Hopefully not, you know. But many times the people closest to us hurt us the most. They lie to us, manipulate us. They say hurtful things to us. Sometimes they physically wound us. Sometimes there's sexual abuse going on. It's, we live in a broken world where the people closest to us oftentimes do the worst things to us. It's true in your life. I don't know who it is. It could be a husband. It could be a wife. It could be a, a brother or a sister or a cousin. It could be a teammate or a roommate or a coach. I don't know who has wounded you, but you know who has wounded you. And it could have happened a year ago, five years ago. It could have happened last week. But someone close to you has hurt you. In fact, you have hurt someone close to you. And here's what's true, and you have to receive this today with an open heart, and that's what I've been praying for, is if you don't forgive that person, the relationship is doomed. It will spiral out of control, and it will dissipate, and it will disappear. How important is forgiveness? It's huge in our life. It keeps the bad things out, like bitterness and anger and resentment and revenge. It keeps all of those things far from our lives. One time Jesus was teaching on forgiveness in the book of Luke chapter 17 and he was saying some pretty direct things and giving some pretty intense instruction and I want you to see exactly what he said. Luke chapter 17 verse 4, even if that person wrongs you seven times in a day and turns to you again and asks for forgiveness, you say it with me, you must forgive. Say it with me again, you must forgive. But that's not the only place in the Bible it says that. Another time, Peter said to Jesus, how many times should I forgive? Jesus said, seven times 70. He did not mean 490. <laughs> he meant as many times as the person offends you. That's how many times you must forgive. Forgiveness ought to be a daily lifestyle that we live. What's interesting is to watch the apostles' response to this really difficult teaching. You want to see it? Verse 5, Luke chapter 17, verse 5. Watch this. The apostle said to the Lord, show us how to increase our faith. To which if you're just reading the Bible, you're like, oh, okay, so different topic, right? So we were just talking about forgiveness. Now we're going to talk about faith. No, this is a conversation. Jesus says, you must forgive every single time, even if it's seven times a day. Day. And then the, the apostles say, okay, well, then you're going to have to show us to increase our faith. Why do they say that? Here's why they say that, because they think this is impossible. <laughs> There's no way. We cannot forgive seven times a day. I can't even forgive once a day. You're going to have to increase my faith because I cannot do that by myself. Now, why would they feel this way? The reason that the disciples would say, the apostles would say, increase my faith in response to this teaching on forgiveness is because their paradigm was very clear from the Old Testament. What was it? Eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. That's what they were accustomed to. Someone comes into your, you know, your, your farm area and they kill three sheep, well, then I get to kill three of your sheep. You come in and steal four of my oxen, well, then I get to steal four of your oxen. It was an eye for an eye and it was a tooth for a tooth. So this whole idea of forgiveness was like, whoa, 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 whoa. We're, we're used to justice. And you want me to forgive? Ah, you're going to have to increase my faith because I don't think that that's possible. The teaching of Jesus could not fit into their paradigm. And maybe that's true for you today. Maybe you hear the idea of forgiveness or message on forgiveness and you just write it off. Some of you have already written me off. Like, well, you know, I can't do that. It's impossible. You don't know what he's done, what she's done. It's too hard, too painful. The betrayal runs too deep. I can't. I can't do that. Maybe even the Bible even teaches that, but I, I cannot do that. And I think one of the main reasons why we struggle to forgive is because we don't understand what forgiveness truly is. A lot of us think that forgiveness is forgetting it. You hear people say, come on, just, just forget it. Forget about it. Some people think that forgiveness is getting over it. Come on, you hear people say, well, I'm just getting over it. Just get over it. People tell you that advice sometimes. Come on, you gotta forgive, get over it. Some people will tell you, come on, you got to forgive. Just move on. Just, just, just come on. Just move past this. this is, you're getting hung up on this. Some people think that forgiveness is ignoring it. Well, just if, I, if I could just ignore it, then maybe I can just move on and 
get over it just by ignoring it. Some people think that forgiveness is, is downplaying it. Just kind of making it sound like it wasn't that bad. It wasn't a big deal. It wasn't that painful. We just downplay it. Maybe it'll be easier to do that. Some people resort to hiding the offense. Covering it up. And we think maybe that has gonna, that's going to help us to forgive. And then some people go as far as denying it. Because if you can deny that it happened, then, then you can you know, maybe save yourself from some suffering. So... We just deny and we pretend like it did not happen. See, the reason why so many of us struggle with forgiveness, just like the apostles did for different reasons, but is that forgiveness is none of these things. Forgiveness isn't denying that it happened. It's not ignoring that it happened. It's not downplaying something that was, that was wrong and evil that took place. It's not saying it, no, that it wasn't wrong or forgetting about it or moving on. Or It's none of those, thing, those things. And that's why we struggle. We don't know what forgiveness is at its root. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. If you're taking notes. Why is this so important? This is so important because it's the roof. It's the roof. It's with, a good house has a good roof to keep the snow and the rain and the ice and the critters and the hail out of the house. We've got to talk about this. Forgiveness is going to protect your core relationships. Well, we've got to know what it is. What is forgiveness? So if you're a note taker today, here it is. Ready? Forgiveness is simply the cancellation of a debt. It's canceling the debt. See, here's what happens when someone offends you or does something to hurt you, lies to you, cheats on you, betrays you, whatever. There's a debt created. And that's why we say these words. Well, you owe me and what? And apology. You guys asleep? Well, what's going on here? Like, let's try, let's try, let's do better. You ready? you ready? You owe me and apology. Okay, okay, right. That's why we say that. That's why we use the word, oh, you did this, now you owe me an apology. Why? Because there's a debt that's created. Maybe you owe me time. Maybe you, maybe you owe me some money. You stole something. You broke something that was mine. You borrowed it. You broke it. You owe me money, right? There's a debt that's created by that. And forgiveness is looking at that person and saying to them very simply, very, this is very clean, okay? Very simple and clean. You don't owe me anymore. To which some of you would say, why are you doing that? <laughs> well, that's a different story. I, I, I mean, you cannot do that or refuse to do that. I just want you to understand what it is. It's not forgetting it. It's not downplaying it. It's not hiding it. It's not denying it. It's not pretending it didn't happen. It's not moving on. It's not forgetting. It's canceling a debt. You with me? Say you with me. Yes? Yes? It's canceling a debt. You don't owe me anymore. Now we can talk about how to do that. Because Paul actually shows us the way to do that. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32, listen to these words. Be kind and compassionate to one another. Awesome, awesome, awesome. We all like that. And then he says this, forgiving each other. He understands we're going to hurt each other. And the closer you are to somebody, the more you're going to hurt them, right? Because you're always around them and you're a sinner and they're a sinner. <laughs> Anybody with me? Anybody married? <laughs> and then he tells us exactly how to do it. Just as in Christ, God forgave you. Boom. Paul just told us exactly how to forgive others. He tells us, look at the way God through Christ has forgiven you and you will know the way to forgive the person who's wounded you. Well, that begs the question, how has God through Christ forgiven me? Here's what he's done for me and for you. Our sin created a debt between us and God. Our lies, our deception, our selfishness, our anger, our lust, our pride, it's created a debt. And that debt created this chasm that was basically impossible for us to build a bridge over, a cross over. So what does God do? God sends Christ, his son, to this earth to die on a cross to pay the debt, to build the bridge for us to be reconciled. Jesus takes the penalty for you and I, by dying for us on the cross. Listen to how Paul explains it. He can explain it better than I can. So we'll just go to his letter in Col the book of Colossians that he wrote to a group of people in the city of Colossae. Listen to what he says. God made you alive with Christ for he forgave you all of your sins, which is awesome. We just got done singing about that. But what does that look like? God forgave us of all of our sins, Paul tells us. He, say it with me, he 
canceled the record of charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. Every single lie, every act of selfishness, every act of lust or greed or pride or slander or gossip, every sin you've ever committed if you've been a Christ follower has been canceled. How? God literally put this, that sin on Christ and nailed it to the cross. And then Paul says, in the same way that God through Christ has canceled your debt, you cancel the debt of the offenders in your life. Is this making sense? Man, when my brain got a hold of this, when my soul got a hold of this, there, it, it became impossible for me to hold a grudge against anybody. How could I, how could you hold a grudge or be resentful against anybody who's wounded us when God has canceled our record? It's impossible. And so that's why Paul plays it out and spells it out just like he did. Whew. Anybody getting this? This good stuff for what? Forgiveness, forgiveness. We become empowered to forgive others when we truly understand how God has forgiven us. That's the first step. It's canceling a debt in the same way that God through Christ has canceled our debt. But we gotta go further than that because that's good, but we need a little bit more help. And thank God there's more help available to do this. If you're a note taker, I want you to, I want to talk about the second idea. What else can we talk? What else? How else do we work this process of forgiveness in our, our life? We have to understand that forgiveness is a gift of the forgiver. It's giving a gift to ourselves. So many of us think that if I forgive this person or that person, I'm doing it for them, but you're not. You're not. It always tickles me when, when uh, someone comes up to me and it happens a lot because apparently I'm a jerk. I don't know. I try not to be a jerk. But people will walk up to me and say, hey, Pastor Danny, I just want to let you know, I forgive you. And there's this awkward moment. And I say, thank you. I, I, it's, uh, I'm, I'm, thank you very, very much. What, what did I do? What, what did I <laughs> And the reason why people will do that, maybe you've done that to somebody in your life, is because we think that they're offering you a gift. But oftentimes the offender doesn't know what they did, doesn't remember what they did, doesn't care what they did, doesn't think what they did is wrong. Maybe they're denying it. They're even dead sometimes. What do you do with somebody who has hurt you deeply and, they've de- and they're deceased? You can't raise them from the dead to give them the gift of forgiveness. They're dead. What is is forgiveness? Forgiveness is a gift that we give to ourselves. In Matthew chapter five, Jesus gives, I think, one of his hardest teachings in the whole Bible. Maybe there's a couple of harder ones. In fact, maybe one day we'll do a whole series called Difficult Things Jesus Said. (laughs) That would be a good one, right? This is, I'm about to show you one of the most difficult things Jesus ever said. Matthew chapter five. And I'm gonna connect the dots for you here in a second. He says, you've heard that it said from our, our, from our ancestors or our ancestors were told, you must not murder. If you commit murder, you're subject to judgment. Now, none of us would argue with that or, or, or say, you know, uh, that's, a, that's a bad idea. We would all agree with that, right? In fact, th- th- this, this last week, I, w- I was in the sauna. I've got sauna stories for you today. And, and, and uh, this is a side note, but this one guy was an atheist and he was talking about, you know, separation for, ch- for church and state and how we shouldn't, you know. And I was like, hey, bud, do you ever wonder where the United States of America got the, you know, the laws like do not murder. And I was like, it's in the Bible. <laughs> so separation of church and state. There you go. Um, <laughs> anyway, I got more stories from the sauna. I can't tell you, but right now, none of us would argue, none of us would argue with, with, with this, right? We're like, yeah, you know, murder's wrong and you're in trouble if you do it. But then Jesus takes it to this. He's always taking things to the next level. It's like here, and then we're going to go here right? He does it again. Watch this. But I'm going to say to you, even when you're angry with someone who screws up the roundabout or makes a terrible call in the basketball game or whatever, right? Even when you're angry with someone, you're subject to judgment. In other words, what that means is you're going to be brought before the Sadducees and the Pharisees, and you're going to be put on trial for anger. Then he takes it a step further. If you call someone an idiot, (laughs) 
I did this last night. I did. So I'm, Jesus has got my attention. Okay, anybody else? If you call someone, by the way, this word in the Greek means empty-headed one. It makes a lot of sense, right? There's a lot of empty-headed people. They, they're, they're, they're everywhere. They really are. If you, if you call someone empty-headed, you're in danger of being brought, brought before the court. Now, again, that makes sense for anger. Uh, I'm sorry, that makes sense for murder. Like, you're in trouble. You're going to, you're going, you're going to go before the judge. You're going to be prosecuted. Anger? But, and now, idiot? And then, and then Jesus goes, oh, oh, I got one more for you. And if you curse someone, now, thankfully, I don't do this. I stopped cussing a long time ago. But if you, if you curse at someone, you're in danger of hell. To which we would go, well, what do you got to bring that into the conversation for? I mean, you're talking about eternal separation from God and flames and terror, torment, torture forever. Like, because of, of a curse? Because of idiot? Because of anger? What is, what is Jesus talking about here? Why is he being so serious? Well, I'm going to put a little diagram up on the board here for you because I believe this explains what Jesus is, why he brings hell into the situation and why he's being so serious. See, what happens is there's the, there's the original offense. Someone close to us hurts us, betrays us, lies to us, steals from us, whatever. Then, if we don't protect our heart, we become really angry. If we don't deal with that anger, it turns into this thing called bitterness. If you don't like that word, similar word, resentment. Our, our soul begins to dry up and becomes cold and bitter. And then if we don't deal with that, which is, this is a pretty bad situation, it moves to this, this fourth level, which is called contempt. Now, once you get contempt into the situation where your soul is, is captured with contempt, you're in real trouble. Because contempt is this mindset or this emotional state where you're looking at the person who's hurt you and you're thinking, you're better off dead. I hate you. I wish you'd get run over by a car. You want to know why Jesus brings hell into the situation and tells us we're going to be brought before the court if we get angry or we call somebody an idiot or we curse at them? It's because if you don't deal with this, this, this cycle in your soul, it's going to ruin your soul. You won't literally be thrown into hell. You won't literally be brought before the court, but your soul's going to die. And that's the penalty you're going to face if you don't deal with what's going on. And then once your soul is trapped in contentment, uh, co uh, contentment, you move to mistreatment, which can look like verbal abuse, physical abuse. It can look like a gun, uh, a gunshot. It can look like a, a bat over the head, an ax over the People kill each other. You say, how do people commit murder? You ever ask yourself that question? It's real simple. This is the process. And here's what's crazy. A human being can go through this process in about 10 seconds. It could take 10 years. It could also take 10 seconds. And so you and I ought to pay attention and go, whoa. Maybe forgiveness is a big deal. It is a big deal because your soul is at stake. 2018, an off-duty police officer gets off a 13-hour shift. She goes to her apartment complex. She walks up the stairs and enters into what she thought, according to her words, was her apartment. She lived on the fourth floor. She opened up a door on the third floor, or maybe it was vice versa. She walked in, and there was a man in that apartment. She said the lights were out. She thought there was an intruder in her apartment. And so she did what police officers do. Two shots. One in the heart, and one missed over the guy's head. Killed him. Maybe you heard this story. Well, she called the police, 911, and they came, and the whole process began. Well, the man who died, 
his brother testified in the court case. And maybe you saw it, maybe you didn't. I want you to see what he said. It's a two-minute clip. It's powerful. And I also want, to, I want you to watch what he does. Check out this clip. Powerful moment. Can you imagine not only forgiving the person who killed your brother, but telling him that you love him and you want what's best for him, and then hugging him? Wow. Later on in an interview, Brant Jean, that was that man's name who testified, this is what he said I don't want to live the rest of my life saying, I hate you. I wish I could get back at you. It just, forgiveness, talking about forgiveness, it just clears your mind. And in my heart, I know that I am free. You want to know why Jesus is so serious about forgiveness and anger? It's because he knows if you don't deal with it, if you don't deal with that cycle, it's going to ruin your soul. Some of you right now, you're trapped in anger and bitterness and resentment because you have chosen not to forgive. And you're in danger. And I want to encourage you to deal with that today. And in a few moments, you're going to have a chance to do so. Let me give you this third idea, and then we'll wrap up. Forgiveness is canceling the debt. It's giving a gift to yourself. And it's, we also have to understand that forgiveness will be withheld from us if we do not forgive. This is not a popular teaching. In fact, I don't hear many preachers talk about it. But Jesus was very clear. In the Sermon on the Mount, this is what he said. This is the, you, the, 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 the prayer in the Sermon on the Mount. You, you guys know the prayer. Some of you memorize it, right? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And then, verse 12, you know what it says. Forgive us of our sins as we have forgiven those who have sinned against us. Have you ever wondered how odd that is? That Jesus would take the time to to teach forgiveness when all his disciples asked for was, can you teach us to pray? He said, yeah, I'll teach you to pray, but I'm gonna weave some teaching in there about how to live, about how to protect your heart, about how to build a roof over your relationships to protect your life from contentment, from contempt and murder. Think about the prayer with me for a second. It's just really odd. Put yourself in it, right? Jesus, forgive me today as I have forgiven my wife and my friends. It's almost as if you're saying, Jesus, I know that my forgiveness is dependent upon the way I forgive others. Do you feel it? It's odd. In other words, I know I'm supposed to be living a lifestyle of mercy and grace, so if I don't, well, then I know you're not gonna forgive me. Exactly. Watch what he says in the next verse. If you forgive those who sin against you, your heavenly Father will, for, will, will forgive you. No problem. But if you say it with me, if you say it with me, refuse. If you say, I ain't doing it. You don't know how hard it was, deep, painful it was, the betrayal runs so deep. You don't know he, he killed my brother. He did. If you sit and you refuse to forgive those who've hurt you, your heavenly Father will, say it with me, not forgive you. Have you heard a sermon on this before? Have you read over this and be like, oh, I don't understand what that means, so just move on? Why would Jesus say that my forgiveness between him and I is dependent upon me forgiving others? Maybe it's because when I hold a grudge against you or someone that's hurt me, I'm really demonstrating that I, I, I have never fully understood the mercy that I've received from God. Remember, when we fully understand the mercy that we receive from God, the way that he's canceled our debt, we should have no problem forgiving others. He's canceled a list of sins against us that's a mile long, and then we have a brother or sister who's done a couple of things to us and we can't forgive? It's like God says, well, you don't get it. It might even be the case where he says, you're not even one of my kids. Wow. Maybe... Maybe our demonstration of grace to others is the evidence of our own salvation. 
And maybe, I'm not sure, maybe the fact that you're holding grudges and your life is filled with bitterness and resentment is evidence that you don't even know the Heavenly Father. And yet your faith is not even authentic. Is that what Jesus could be saying? Whatever he's saying here, what I know to be true and certain is that it is a big deal for you to forgive. He says, if you withhold forgiveness towards the people who have offended you, I will withhold forgiveness towards you. I think when we hold a grudge against other people, we end up looking nothing like Jesus. Jesus walked around as the embodiment of mercy, the embodiment of grace. He hung out with tax collectors and prostitutes and all the worst of the worst. His whole life was mercy. And then here you and I come along and, and we're, gr- we're holding grudges and resentment is filling our heart and we have contentment for people. We don't even look like children of God. We don't resemble our heavenly father at all. But I think, I think there's even a stronger reason why Jesus uses such strong language It's because when we refuse to forgive, we cut ourselves off from the life that's available to us. You know, you were designed to live a life free from anger. You were. You were designed to live a life free from resentment and bitterness. Contempt should never even enter your soul. You were designed to live a life filled with joy and peace and purpose and love. Think about the commandment that Jesus gives us. Love your neighbor as yourself. How can you do that if you hate them? And how did you end up hating them? Because they did something to you or to someone that you love. And you let that anger turn into resentment. That resentment turned into resent- bitterness. And that bitterness turned into contempt. And you hate them. And then you hear Jesus command to love them. And you're like, oh, it's impossible. It's because you, your heart's infected. How important is forgiveness? What do you think? What do you think? It's the roof that keeps all this stuff out of our life. You want to have great relationships? You must forgive. You must pray the prayer, Lord Jesus, forgive me as I forgive others in my life. What have I said today? I've said a lot. I put a lot on you. Hopefully you're writing notes, taking this, taking this stuff down. This is life-changing stuff. We've talked about forgiveness is not forgetting about it. It's not getting over it. It's not moving on. Forgiveness is not ignoring that it happened. Forgiveness is not downplaying it. It's not hiding it. It's not denying it. Forgiveness is saying, you don't owe me anymore. Forgiveness is a gift that you give to yourself. And forgiveness will be withheld from you if you do not forgive others. So I've got a question for you. It's a tough one. Some of you might lose sleep over this tonight and tomorrow and maybe for a week. But that's okay. Who do you need to forgive? Who is it in your life? It's time to do business. At all of our campuses, we have our worship teams coming out, and, and, and this is by design. We want to create some space for you not to go out into the parking lot and get your car and leave. We want to create space for you to forgive the person who's wounded you to name them right now during this song and tell God, this is who it is, this is what they did, and today I'm choosing to cancel the debt. I'm gonna give a gift to myself because I wanna be in close relationship with you. This space right here is designed for you to actually forgive right now. A lot of people think they gotta go chase down the person who wounded them, no. You don't have to do coffee. You don't have to do lunch. You don't even have to tell them. Listen, if, if, I, if I've hurt you in any way, you don't have to tell me. Just forgive me. You don't have to email. Just between you and God. So I forgive that knucklehead up there. He's an idiot. You know, just forgive me. And I'll do the same for you. Right? It's a choice to say. It doesn't even involve the other person. If it did, we would never be able to forgive somebody who's died. So right now, during this space, we've created this space for you. Not to leave, but to actually open up your heart and say, God, I need your help. Increase my faith. I choose to cancel the debt right now. You do business with God. And then we'll wrap the service up when we're done. My hope and prayer for you is that you are able to forgive just now. 
and to step into freedom, the freedom that you were created for. And before we close and wrap up, I know there's a few of you here today. Maybe you're watching online, maybe you're here physically, but you need to step into the freedom of knowing Jesus Christ personally. A few moments ago, I talked about how he, he died for our sins. He canceled the debt, the written record of sins held against us by nailing it to the cross. That was the purpose of Christ's coming into this world. He didn't come to build churches or set up a religion. That's what we did. And we do that to get the message out. That's the only thing we do. That's why we do it. That's why we have churches. To get the message out that you can be in a relationship with God because Christ has canceled your debt. Is anybody excited about that? Jesus has died in our place. And maybe the hesitation of why you haven't jumped into Emmanuel or some other church or faith is because you think it's all about buildings and churches and, and religion. And it's not. Like if somebody would have told me when I was 17, like, hey, guess what? You, you know, you should turn your life over to God because church is awesome. I'm like, no, it ain't. Church is boring. People fall asleep in church. Hopefully not our church, but you know what I'm talking about, you know? And, and, and religion sucks. And church is boring. And so if somebody would have said to me, sign up for religion or church, I'd be like, no, thank you. But when I heard that the God of the universe sent his only son to this earth to die in my place because he loved me, I was like, well, that's a different story. You mean I can know God personally by talking to him and trusting him? Oh, the, count me in for that because I knew I was a piece of trash. And if somebody was willing to die for someone like me, I'm like, dude, that's awesome. And that's true for you today. This isn't about church or religion. This is about the God of the universe tapping you on the shoulder, saying, I wanna love you, I wanna know you today. <laughs> Amen? So will you come? Will you come? Will you put your faith in Christ? All you have to do is, it's a prayer a child can pray. Say, Jesus, I trust you. I believe you died on the cross. You canceled my record of sin held against you, and I ask you to be my savior. If you'd like to do that right now, I'm gonna lead you in a simple prayer. Will you pray with me real quick if you feel led to? Turn your heart over to God. You're not joining a church. You're not joining a religion. You are putting your faith in Christ. Just say this to him. Dear Jesus, I'm a sinner. Broken every one of your laws. If not practically in my heart, I have. Would you forgive me? I believe you died in my place. Paid the price for my sin. Canceled the record of wrongs held against me because you love me. So cleanse my heart today. Make me as white as snow. Make me your child today. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you just prayed that prayer, our church wants to celebrate with you. Don't be nice and loud, church. Amen. Woo. Hey, before you get out of here real quick, if you trusted Christ, we would love to get you started with a Bible. We've got a Bible inside this box. We call it our saved box. There's also a cup in here to say congratulations and some more information about our church. So if you text the word saved to 65248, you can grab one of these in the information desk out there. If you're watching online, give us a little bit more info and we'll send one to you in the mail. Let's pray church and then we'll hand things off to the local teams. Father, we love you. Thank you so much for the opportunity to talk about relationships and, and the good bones of what a relationship looks like commitment, and trust, communication, and forgiveness. Help us to take these things and implement them into our lives so our relationships can be healthy. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Right now, I'm going to hand things off to the local teams. I love you guys. See you next week. Bring a friend.